almighty and everlasting God, give to us the increase of faith, hope, and charity, that we may obtain that which thou dost promise. Make us to love that which thou dost command. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hymn 104. We're still in Christmas hymns here. This is a 20th century hymn. A stable lamp is lighted, whose glow shall wake the sky. The sky, stars shall bend their voices, and every stone shall cry, and every stone shall cry. And straw like gold shall shine, a barn shall harbor heaven, a stall become a shrine. Very evocative. Well, we are working with Cardinal Gaskets, Henry VIII, and English monasteries, an attempt at the history of the suppression to illustrate the history of their suppression. Francis Aidan Gasket, monk of the Order of St. Benedict, sometimes prior of St. Gregory's Monastery, Downside Abbey, Bath. Um, he gets various reports, apparently Eamon Duffy, a Roman Catholic historian at Oxford, says of Cardinal Gasket that is proof that you can be a good churchman and a lousy historian. He's also been questioned as to the, his, the honesty factor in terms of falsification of history. But I just have no opinion on that. I've seen the name a lot of times, but try to get a sense of the man and also an insight in the Benedictine thinking and an insight into monast monastic living, which is far from the scribes of monastic lifestyle on a naval vessel, which was for all of us. Naval vessels. This is published in 1888. At the feet of His Holiness, Pope Leo III, this volume, the first fruit of work undertaken in obedience to his command, is at this time of his sacerdotal jubilee, laid as a testimony of filial devotion. Quite an obsequy or encomium, as usual. Contents to the reader, Introduction, Monastic Hill, England, Chapter 1, The Dawn of the Difficulties, Looks Good, War, Roses, Black, Death, Wycliffe, Simon Fish, Chapter 2, Pre Precedence for the Suppression of Monasteries, William Wickham, Henry V, Henry IV, um, oh, it's got a note on Jesus College. Bishop Fisher, Chapter 3, Cardinal Wolsey in the Mont Monasteries. And then Chapter 4, the famous Holy Maid of Kent, which figures into our interest in, uh, he, she was down at a convent in Canterbury. Archbishop Warham and John Fisher thought highly of her. Cranmer and Henry didn't. Chapter 5, the Friars Observant. Chapter 6, the Carthusians, and was, did uh, uh, Bishop Hooper join those? I just offhand forget. Chapter 7, the Visitation of the Monasteries, 1535-36. Chapter 8, the Parliament of 1536, and the Suppression of the Lesser Monasteries. Chapter 9, the Comperta Monastica and other charges against the monk monks. Huh, that'd be interesting. Thomas Cromwell, Chapter 10. Chapter 11, the chief accusers of the monks, Leighton, Lee, and Apprice in London. 
an appendix list of the English Carthusian monasteries and houses of four orders of friar at the time of their suppression with a map of the same. We would say at the outset that we don't just jump in here and condemn monastic, monastic living. You know, we're Protestants and Reformed. Um, we want to be careful, as is our DNA demands. We want to affirm and deny. We want to affirm that a lot of good scholastic work was done, manuscripts copied, books preserved, Divine worship services were ongoing, albeit in Latin in the medieval, high medieval period. There's some downsides, mandatory celibacy. Um, but on the upside, the scholastic element, scholarly element, worship element, prayer element, element of hospitality, element of caring for the elderly and the sick, some cases doing farm work in and about reaching out socially and intellectually to the people so we're, we're careful we want to be careful what we affirm and what we deny to the reader custom requires for a book some words of personal introduction this present work has no pretense to be more than the title pledge claims for, claims for an attempt <clears throat> to illustrate the history of a great event in our national annals. My sympathies are naturally engaged, but I have striven to avoid anything like presenting or pleading a case, which indeed I felt would defeat my purpose. If I am, have insisted more on the facts which tell in favor of the monsters than on those which tell against them, it is because the latter are well known and have been repeated and proved on and emphasized for three centuries and a half. Or that there is anything to say, on the other hand, for the monks has been little recognized even by those who would be naturally predisposed in their favor. And this is why we want to read this Roman Catholic angle and we'll keep in mind Prof. Duffy's warning. My belief is that the facts speak strongly enough for themselves. I've endeavored to add as little as possible of, of my own to the story they tell. All I desire is that my readers should judge from the letters, documents, and opinions, which will be found in the following pages. <sighs> Whether they bear justice has hitherto been done to the memory of the monastic order in England. I have endeavored as far as I possibly could to write from a personal inspection of the documents which I've made use. Good, good, good. My searches have taken me to many places and have brought me in contact with many people to whom I was previously a stranger. I felt th my thanks for help and encouragement are due to many, too many to name individually. The place in which I write may excuse a particular reference of matter to the Lord or Bishop of Bath and Wells. From the varying registers, I have received the same unvarying courtesy and kindness. From public officials, attention to all the demands is oftentimes regarded as a right, both at the Record Office and the British Museum. Though I trust I have never given trouble without need, my requests must, I feel has sometimes seemed importunate and even unreasonable. Without the concurrence and ever patient kindness with which I met at both institutions, my labors have been indefinitely prolonged. God bless the librarians and the archivists. Distinct callings, always ready, willing, and able to bring out this, that, and the other. How wonderful it is in the dusty archives. <laughs> the folks up at Princeton are just glorious. I've done some work up there. I want to like to do that at Lambeth. I'd like to do it at Canterbury, too. It wouldn't be fun. Uh, alas. Or at Cambridge Corpus Christi, the Parker Collection. Downside Monastery, October 26, 1887. My understanding is that he was a part of 
the Roman commission to study the validity of Anglican orders, and he had a major uh, input on that. And then in 1896, he said, uh, you Anglicans, those orders aren't valid. Never been rescinded, to my knowledge, although there's a lot of happy talk. I always talk to Roman Catholics. I spent a good year with Roman Catholics at Villanova. Am I a Romanist? Absolutely not. Protestant Reformed, confessionally Reformed, with a prayer book. But as a chaplain, I worked and lived. I slept in the snows up in, tent, in, in a tent, a priest and I shared that in our assistance. But many times laughing and goofing around. <laughs> Father Jeff and others too. Father Paul, a Jesuit. Fun to be with. We differed, of course. Anyways, monastic England. The ruined abbeys of England are evidence of a past which, however diversely it may be judged in other respects, all agree it was great. To some, the crumbling wall or broken arch speaks eloquently of the rapacity of an English king and indicates the completeness of his spoliation or spoliation. Others, again, are reminded of the reasons pretended by the spoiler. Alas, it is to be feared to most Englishmen the desecrated sanctuary calls up one thought above all else, the thought of wasted, wanton, and vicious lives. And I have no doubt some of those places were a little seamy, hot and seedy. But not so fast here, Cardinal, which compelled Henry drastic measures of reform. I think there's an economic element and also a theological element. I think, and this is my view, subject to further review if needed. And Henry saw that in order to break Rome's jurisdiction, he had to break the monastic hold on the loyalty of his monastic subjects. For many generations, anecdotes about wickedness, the wickedness of monk and nun, had been listened to and accepted as simple truth. And even well wishers to the monastic institute have thought it best friendliness to observe our counsel, to observe or counsel silence. Undoubtedly, it is no uninviting task to attack a tradition so long implanted. A wholesome horror of monk and monastery has been imparted with early knowledge at the mother's knee. The teaching first imbibed and latest lost would almost seem that in this regard, the national character of honesty and fairness has been permanently warped. Englishmen have been wont to extend consideration even to a fallen enemy. In this case, they appear to have neither mercy nor pity for those were among the most honored and cherished of their own household. The truth is that Henry's scheme for lowering monks in the popular estimation, though it did not impose on a people who knew them by experience, has served its purpose with subsequent generations. All that men of the stamp of John Bale, close quote, justly says a modern writer, quote, could do in the way of defiling the memory of Cenobites in general has been done. Though Bale is a discredited man, ah, not so fast. You know, Bale is a discredited man. He's discredited because he was a, he was tough. He was sort of a Lutheresque type fellow. Have completed a work which can scarcely be done and undone in the memory of those who dutifully preserve religion and increased learning in the land is almost hopelessly besmirched. That the state of religious life in England, as described in the letters and reports of Henry's chosen visitors, was bad, is true. These reports even do not by any means bear out the popular impression. The real question, however, that needs consideration is the worth of the visitor's word. Okay. So it's a question of credit of the visitors who will be faithful representatives doing the injunctions of Cromwell, of Wolsey too, and Henry, or 
This is also going to bear on Gasket's credibility. Edmund Burke speaks in accord with the dictates of mere common sense when he writes, I rather suspect that vices are feigned or exaggerated when profit is looked for in the punishment. An enemy is a bad witness. A robber is worse. For three centuries, the only voices raised in defense of English monasteries have been those of antiquarians. <laughs> who might be supposed to have a natural sympathy for a great romantic past. And even those from Camden downwards have found it well to make excuse for their weaknesses. And we want to think about the same thing in connection with the French Revolution. What was going on there in the 1790s? What was their view of the monastic situation? and have not failed to add, however incongruously it might run with the context, the general sentence of condemnation. Burnett fixed, so far as the history is concerned, what it had to say on the subject, and the history of the Reformation was deemed sufficient to dispense with all need for further inquiry. And the last resort, the utterances of the words Comperta and Black Book, was enough to warn the curious of the adventurous off dangerous ground. It is only of late years that subject has come within the scope, within the scope of ordinary historical investigation. And some earnest and truthful writers have paved the way for a juster, juster estimate of the case. Among these stands preeminent Canon Dixon, who justly claims, strange as the claim may seem, in regard to a subject about which so much has been written. Canon Dixon, to have laid before the student of history for the first time a connected and particular account of the suppression of the English monasteries. The present work is an attempt to carry the investigation yet a step further forward and utilizing the mass of scattered material, still unpublished and unconsulted, to treat the suppression not as an episode of a greater subject, but as an object of special inquiry. That the monasteries in the 15th and 16th centuries were all that could be desired in discipline and vigor would be maintained by no one who has studied the subject the circumstances of the troubled times in many instances no doubt exerted an influence on the interior spirit of the cloister as it did on the church at large. For entering on the subject of this book, it will be well to sketch slightly a picture of the daily life practiced in one of the great and solemn monasteries in which Henry, using the parliament as mouthpiece, Thanks God that religion is right, well kept. It will be necessary also briefly to recall to mind of the reader how vast the monastic system interwove itself. Yeah, this is a good point. In the social, political, and ecclesiastical life of the kingdom. And that's one of our purposes in reading this, among others. However much monasteries might differ in details of arrangement, the fundamental principle of all is life by rule spent in the service of God. First duty in the monastery was regular service of prayer and praise. Besides this, however, in most monastic houses, a considerable part of the day was set apart for active duties. The cares of the great administration absorbed the elder energies of the elder members, while teaching, studying, and cultivation of arts and sciences occupied the attention of the whole community. As a rule, early, rising early, simple, fair, and constant work, done only with the hope of a higher reward in the world to come, was the lot of the monk. Whether such a life was profitable or not must depend upon opinion. Of those who write must speak so easily of lazy bunks, 
would with candor try to realize as a fact the life thus led, they would at least acquit them of this charge. Dean Church draws an admirable picture of a monastery in its outward aspect at a period three or four hundred centuries earlier than I've now dealt with. The governing thought of monastic life, he says, was that it is a warfare, militia, and a monastery was a camp or barrack. There was continual drill and exercise at early hours, fixed times, pointed tasks, hard fare, stern punishments. Watchfulness was to be incessant, obedience prompt and absolute. No man was to murmur. What seems to us trifling or vexatious must be judged of and allowed for by reference to the idea of the system. Training is rigorous, concert as ready and complete, subordination is fixed, fulfillment of orders as unquestioning as in a regiment or ship's crew, which is to do good service. Nothing was more easy to understand in those days than any man next to his being a soldier than his being a monk. It was the same thing, the same sort of life, but with different objects. For the objects in view, the organization given us by Lafranc and the regulations drawn up for the English monasteries was simple and reasonable. The buildings were constructed, the day was arranged, the staff of officers were appointed in reference to the three main purposes for which a monk professed to live worship, improvement, work. There were three principal places which were the scenes of his daily life, the church and in the church, especially the choir, the chapter house and the cloister. And for each of these, the work was carefully laid out. A monk's life at that period was eminently a social one. He lived night and day in public, and the cell seems to have been an occasional retreat or reserved for the highest officers. The cloister is the place of business, instruction, reading, conversation, common study, workshop, and parlor of all inmates of the house. The professed brethren, the young men whom they were teaching or preparing for life, either as monks or in the world, the children who formed the school attached to the house, many of whom had been dedicated by their parents to this kind of service. It must be remembered that denunciations as to the laxity of life, even when made about the monasteries of the 15th and 16th centuries, rest on a rule, as a rule, on a comparison with primitive fervor. Whatever, and it's got a footnote here to the life of St. Anselm, Whatever else may be said as to the lives of the monks at this period, it must be confessed that the common and ordinary routine of their houses raised them immeasurably above the level of life around them. The Episcopal visitations in the religious houses prove conclusively that whatever failings or even graver delinquencies required censure and correction in the case of individuals, the method of life for the community remained the same, and that in no sense could it with truth be called a life of ease and sloth. The very divisions of the day, which were practically the same in most religious houses, are evidence of the real character of monastic observance continued down to the very eve of destruction. The night office, now known as Matins, not later than two in the morning. In many monasteries, and when the length of the office for additional solemnity required, it commenced at midnight. Two hours were occupied in solemn chanting and singing of this, the first of their daily benedictions of Durham before the dissolution when they were at matins and service at midnight, then one of the said monks did play on the organs themselves and no other. The matins and the matitudini laudis form practically one service, occupying the two hours. Rites of Durham's got a footnote. This document stands alone as a 
connected account of life in a great monastic community at the very moment of its destruction. It ill accords with later popular traditions. Some people may be inclined to a view a picture drawn by the Laudate Temporis Octi. It is certainly the work of a man who had no personal information and had actually seen what he describes. For those who know the monastic life and practice, the innumerable touches of detail afford convincing evidence of the truth of the description. It presents a picture of regularity, gravity, discipline, and order such as any regular house might well aspire to. That the monastery was in an excellent state of discipline may be judged from a letter of the visitor Leighton, written 26 January 1536. Your injunctions, he says, can have no effect in Durham Abbey in some things, for there was never yet woman in the abbey further than the church, nor they, the monks, never come within town. The night service was followed by a brief period of rest, till at five the community again assembled in the choir for the office of prime, which was followed by the daily chapter. Their faults were corrected, encouragement given, the labors of the community at portion, and when occasion met, required matters of common interest discussed and arranged. At the stroke of six, the short chapter mass was sung, and after this study or exercise occupied the monks till eight o'clock. That time, once more, the stroke of the bell called them to choir and the high mass, to which the time till 10 was allotted. Then came the meal of the day, except on fast days, when it was some hours later. In the refectory, strict order was preserved, and the superior or his chief officer presided. The monks waited in turns upon each other. During the meal, the sacred scriptures were read. Also in the east end of the frontier, we are told of Durham, stood a fair table with a decent screen of wainscot over it for the master of the novices and the novices to dine and sup in at which time the master observed this wholesome and goodly order for the constant instruction of their youth and virtue and learning. This is one of the novices at the election and appointment of the master did read some part of the Old and New Testament in Latin at the dinner time. Having a convenient place at the south end of the high table within a fair glass and iron, with iron certain steps of stone iron rails on one side, upon which lay the Holy Bible, where one of the novices elected by the master was appointed to read a chapter. This being ended, the master did toll a bell hanging over his head, thereby giving warning to one of the novices to come to the high table and say grace. And so after grace said, they departed to their books. But before their works, says the writer, the monks were accustomed every day after they had dined to go through the cloister into the center garth where all the monks were buried. And they did stand all bareheaded to a certain long space, praying among the tombs for their brethren souls being buried. And when they had done their prayers, then they turned to the cloister and there did study their books until three o'clock when they went to Vespers. This was their daily exercise and study every day after they had dined. Once more, the Durham record affords us a glimpse of what after the church is the center of the cloistered life, the cloister itself. And the north side of the cloister from the corner over against the church wall to the corner over against the dormitory door was all finely glazed from the top to the sill within a little of the ground in the cloister garth. And in every window, three pews or studies where every one of the old monks had his study, each by himself, that when they had dined, they did resort to that place of cloister and there study their books, every one in his study, an afternoon till Vesper time. This was the exercise every day. All these pews or studies were finely wainscotted very closely. The word used by the author of rites is carol, 
here as in many other instances a modern word is substitute the convenience of the general reader. Well, he's making a very compelling case for an academic life. Thankful for the Cardinal's input work. <clears throat> Hymn 104. This child through David's city shall ride in triumph by. The palm shall strew its branches, and every stone shall cry, and every stone shall cry, O heavy, dull, and dumb, and lie within the roadway to pave his kingdom come. Let us pray. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and under the Lamb forever. Amen. Godspeed.